So our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Reinhard Flick. He's a coastal oceanographer that was born in Germany and grew up in New York City. He earned a PhD in oceanography from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, University of California, San Diego, after obtaining his BS in physics from Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in New York. He is staff oceanographer for the state of California Department of Parks and Recreation. You know, that's a great position to have right there. I want to be the uh, staff oceanographer for the California Department of Recreation one day. I'm going to grow up to be that. Uh, Division of Boating and Waterways, um, a research associate at Scripps and principal oceanographer with San Diego's Terra Costa Consulting Group. Thank, thank you, Dave. Uh, you left out the most interesting parts about Antarctica, but that's all right. Dan's going to talk about Antarctica, so we'll get to that. Um, contrary to popular belief, it's still mighty cold down there. So uh, I have to give credit to uh, the institutions and the consultants that are at the bottom here. All right, so there's the Scripps logo, there's the Parks logo. Uh, I, I do quite a bit of consulting work, or I try to, because they don't pay state employees very much. Um, and Terra Costa Consulting Group and Coastal Environments uh, are the two groups I do most of that work with, and I've learned a lot from doing consulting work. And it's uh, an important part of applying uh, the academic work uh, that we're doing. Uh, I, I don't know what the title means. Uh, Jerry's not here. Uh, my jokes are going to fall. My, my Jerry jokes are going to fall flat. Uh, I don't know what this redrawing the map uh, means. Uh, and frankly, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, I've talked here about a half a dozen times. Who's heard me before? Can't see anything, but OK. All right. So, I'm trying to do something new tonight. Uh, what I want to do tonight is start a conversation that's going to be important, uh, first of all, first in time, first of all, and most of all in Long Beach for the people that live in the peninsula. Anybody here from the peninsula? Yeah, yeah, I'm really sorry to see that. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Uh, so I, I, I want to start the conversation uh, of in the next few decades, uh, as sea level rises, not much will happen on most of the coast that's different, in, at least qualitatively different than what's happening now. But eventually, eventually, and this is many decades, perhaps even as long as 100 years, most of the coast as we know it today and the development that's on the coast, not just private but public, will be uninhabitable. It, it will not be viable to keep the infrastructure that we have in the locations that we have it. And what I'd like to do is begin to have, have some beginning to the discussion about how we get from here to there. And what are the questions we need to ask? What are the possibilities, at least as I understand them? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking partly about things that I'm not an expert in, uh, but nevertheless, I want to raise that. So this is going to be a little bit different than uh, what you've probably heard me talk about before, even though some of the slides are going to be uh, the same. So if you've looked at the syllabus, if you've looked at the, uh, the program, uh, it says something about Winston Churchill versus Woody Allen. I have to apologize. I know Woody Allen is an alleged creep. Uh, I know that. Nevertheless, his jokes, are, at least this one, uh, is still uh, relevant to today's discussion. So this whole idea of Winston Churchill versus Woody Allen, you'll see it in a minute. It basically comes down to fight or flight. And that's what I tried to outline uh, in, in the first few sentences about what do we do over the next few decades to plan for what comes later when the coast is no longer viable uh, in, in the same way that it is today. So fighting will work for a while. Eventually, we'll have to flee. Uh, and the question is how that flight's going to work. And the, the, the quotes I'll show you from these two characters uh, summarize that, that discussion, I would say. So first of all, what are the questions? Uh, if you've heard me talk before, I'm going to go over these again. Uh, to me, what the important questions are about uh, the physical setting uh, of the coast of California, especially focusing on California. Uh, the uh, human influences that are so important, especially in Southern California, especially in the urban areas. I'll talk very briefly about climate and sea level. Dan is going to fill in uh, much of that uh, 
discussion a little bit later. Uh, you know, as Dave said, uh, English isn't my first language, so I always have to study vocabulary. So I want to talk a little bit about the vocabulary of, of risk assessment to define the words. Uh, I want to talk a little bit specifically about Long Beach and its history, and then a little bit uh, about flooding, erosion, and damage, and how I see, based on the previous, the setting, especially in Long Beach, how the rise in sea level may start to influence and affect the coast in the way that I've uh, described, where ultimately we'll, we'll probably have to give up many of the area. Now, loss management, uh, there's a there's a saying in the financial world, I guess, not that I know anything about finances, but uh, when there are losses, uh, they call them haircuts, right? Somebody has to take a loss. So the question is, who's going to take the haircut? And how, you know, how much of a crew cut is it going to be? OK, uh, so challenges, vulnerabilities, and trade-offs. Uh, and the, the point here is, the bottom line here is that many of these trade-offs and many of the vulnerabilities, many of the challenges all from sea level rise and, and, and ocean erosion and flooding and damages exist now. This is nothing new in that sense. And I'll, we'll go into why that is in a second. So these three things, I think, are important uh, as far as uh, uh, how we have to deal with the coast. So first of all, finding and maintaining a balance between uh, and among conflicting needs. So commercial, institutional, you can read it there. These are different needs on the coast, different, uh, uh, different important functions that the coast provides. Um, sand supply, sand retention, and coastal armoring. So those are conflicting in some ways. How do we balance those? Uh, to get and keep enough of the beach width, first of all, and secondly, the third bullet point down there, preserving and restoring, keeping some of the natural environment that's all important to us. I mean, one of the reasons you want to live next to the coast is because uh, of the natural environment and the natural beauty of especially California. And the, the point here is that these, uh, these conflicts and these trade-offs that are already being made, are already necessary, all of these will be exacerbated. They'll be made worse, gradually, gradually, gradually worse as sea level rise uh, continues. It's not like it just started yesterday. We'll talk a little bit about that. But as it accelerates into the future. All right, so there they are. So. Fight or flight? Well, uh, you know, if you saw the previews or if you saw the movie, the Dunkirk movie, uh, there's this great scene in there where Churchill, during the darkest days of 1940, uh, is talking to Parliament, and they're going to fight in the stairwells and in the broom closets and on the lawn and in the forest and on the beaches. So finally, at the near the end, he says, we're going to fight in the beaches. We shall never surrender. Okay. And then on the other hand, you had little Nebish from New York over here. Uh, now, imagine in 1960, this is from his Cabaret Act, this quote from his Cabaret Act in the 1960s. There were about six or seven people in the entire world that had any idea or, or gave a rat's patootie about sea level. And he says, I've always had an inordinate fear of sea level. Imagine how funny that must have been. Uh, at, at the time, notwithstanding, not, notwithstanding the, you know, the things he's accused of and may be guilty of. Let's leave that aside for a second. So here are these two things, fight or flight. Now, fighting will work uh, for a time, and we'll go through some of the techniques that are used to fight uh, erosion, flooding, and damages on the coast. But ultimately, sea level, especially if it rises to these levels that uh, you know, we think are possible, uh, which is, uh, for example, if all the ice in the world melts, you're talking about over 200 feet of sea level. Well, uh, you know, that's going to be hard to engineer, uh, uh, you know, to withstand that. Uh, let's see, what else was I going to say? Oh, yes. So in Churchill's case, right, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall never surrender. So this is when the threat was coming from Europe. The threat was coming from Germany specifically across the sea. Okay, what's different now? The threat is the sea itself. It's not coming across the sea. It is the sea. That's the difference. 
All right. Now, where are we? Well, we are on the edge of the Pacific Ring of Fire, right? Long Beach is right there somewhere. The West Coast, California is right here. Uh, and the same thing that makes this ring of fire so dangerous, right? Causing earthquakes, the tectonic motion of these plates uh, also makes it so beautiful. It's, be it's, it's because of the location uh, of, uh, you know, where we are in California relative to these tectonic plates. And there's a great paper you should read if you have a chance. It's in the Journal of Geology in 1973. Uh, by Inman and Nordstrom, it's called the Tectonic Classification of Coasts. So the tectonic setting goes a long way to defining what the coastal uh, situation is and why it looks the way it does. Uh, so in the next slide, we have a little bit closer view of the, uh, the plate boundary between the North Pacific Plate, North, uh, North America Plate over here, and the Pacific Plate over here. And the boundary is the San Andreas Fault System, which is actually like twice the width of California. It's not just the one fault, right? That's the main strain. Uh, but it's this whole series of faults. Now, the important thing on the smaller scale here, and it's especially obvious in San Diego, is the fact, but it's also true all the way up the, all the, way up the coast, um, all the way up the coast of California. It's, it's, it, the, the, the feature that's important for these, um, uh, about these faults is that they're not straight, they're sinuous. So they're S-shaped. And as this motion, this lateral motion occurs, you'll see in my little prop here, see I brought my own fault with me. Usually I say it's Jerry's fault, but this is my fault in this case. So here's a sinuous fault, can you all see that? Okay, so now if I move, the Pacific Plate north relative to the other one, you see what happens. See right here, right here, something's got to give, something has to go up. And right here, something drops down. So in San Diego, uh, where these things collide, those are the headlands, like, like Point Loma and Point La Jolla. Up here, it's Palos Verdes, Palos Verdes. Uh, Point Doom. Uh, so, so these are the headlands where these plates collide. Oh, and what are these? I'll give you a guess. So this would be San Diego Bay and Mission Bay. So it's this opening up that then fills with water and fills with sediment uh, and, and makes our bays. So the, the, the LA region is a little bit more complicated uh, because you had this turning motion, uh, this whole block. You might wonder why the why the uh, San Gabriel Mountains are sideways when everything else is oriented more or less north-south, but somehow a block of, these, of this crust got caught in there and rotated 90 degrees, and in fact, it's still rotating. If we wait long enough, you know, another 10 million years or so, they'll be completely turned around. They'll be parallel to the coast again, uh, uh, but pointed in the other direction. Anyway, uh, that's beside the point. So that's why this coast looks the way it does, and one of the consequences and a guide to the future of evolution, one of the consequences of this very young, very steep, and eroding coast is the fact that the beaches are relatively thin and they're relatively narrow because we just haven't had enough time. We've only had, uh, well, 30 million years ago when, when some of these processes started, the plates started to collide, uplifting, and in the last maybe three to five million years when the coast started to look more like it did like it does today, um, uh, there just hasn't been enough time compared to the East Coast, where we're talking about 300 million years since the Atlantic Ocean started to open up, right, to form the Atlantic, when South America and Africa were joined and Europe and North America were joined, and then that opened up uh, to open up the Atlantic and all of the erosion of the East Coast mountains started to occur and provided much, much, much more sand. So we have a lack of sand generally uh, on our coast, and we have a steep topography, narrow, thin beaches, uh, usually with a sea cliff. Almost all of the California coast, most of the California coast has, is backed by a sea cliff. So uh, this, this is good news and bad news uh, as far as being able to cope with sea level rise, and we'll, we'll get into this in a second. All right, so uh, finally, as far as the setting goes, this is 
uh, these are a couple of pictures, uh, three pictures, two of Santa Monica Bay, so looking uh, north towards Santa Monica from Marina del Rey, that's Marina del Rey entrance, and looking south from, again, aerial view from Marina del Rey looking south. And what's so striking here is that in the 1930s, these beaches essentially didn't exist. So you can see pictures in the 1930s of waves lapping into these houses. But since that time, since the 40s up to about the 90s, there have been provided about 30 million cubic yards of sand through uh, dredging operations. Marina del Rey, for example, that was finished in the 60s. Uh, the airport, the uh, Hyperion sewage treatment plant, the power plant and many, many other smaller construction projects provided sand in great abundance. And secondly, all of the structures. So here, I think that's the Venice uh, uh, breakwater out here. Further north uh, is the Santa Monica breakwater off the Santa Monica Pier. The jetties at Marina del Rey, like many other jetties, uh, trap sand. You see that trapped here. So the structure stabilized the beach. The sand provided by, in this case, engineering works, not put on the, not put on the, on the, on the beaches uh, in, on purpose to make them wider. But nevertheless, the principle is very, very clear. In California, we can have much wider beaches than the natural situation would, would dictate by bringing sand and stabilizing with structures the sand so it stays around longer and the waves don't move it away uh, uh, you know, faster than, than, than they would otherwise. So here's a picture of Long Beach uh, down here. Uh, we are at present right there in that little lagoon right here. And Long Beach also has a sea cliff. It's all along here. So later on, when, when you leave the aquarium and you drive up either Pine or you drive up, uh, what's the other street down there, Linden? or Alamitos, uh, be aware of when you're driving up the sea cliff because they've bulldozed out the sea cliff, the roads go up, and you drive up into Long Beach proper, which is built uh, on one of these terraces. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, maybe. Uh, a flat area, mesa areas that were wave cut when sea level was higher. Uh, land was lower relative to sea level, and it's been uplifted since. Um, so the peninsula down here, you see this, uh, we're talking here about uh, uh, various uh, drainage patterns, various drainage locations for the San Gabriel River. And so the, uh, the, uh, the area of the peninsula and Belmont Shores here, and of course Naples, are, are all uh, essentially in these low-lying areas that are river valleys. It's a, river, it's a filled up river valley. Uh, and you see this over and over again. This is a pattern that repeats uh, up and down the, uh, the California coast. And I'll show that in a second. And I want to talk specifically about the peninsula a little bit and how it relates to other similar settings and why, uh, because of the low-lying nature of this compared to Long Beach proper uh, and San Diego proper, for example, that are built up on these uplifted mesa areas, much, much less susceptible to sea level rise in the future compared to these low-lying, uh, lagoonal-type uh, fronting uh, environments. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, good. All right, so uh, I want to go back to um, uh, when, when, when Jerry first came to Long Beach. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that was around here about 80 million years ago. Uh, so this is the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Um, you know, when Jerry left New York and came to, to came west, um, it's when the meteor struck with a comet or whatever it was, struck uh, Yucatan and wiped out the dinosaurs. Subsequently, over the next few million years, the dinosaurs died off uh, because of this catastrophic, or we think because of this catastrophic event. So I want you to pay particular attention here to the temperatures that we're talking about. Over here, they're in centigrade. Over there, they're in Fahrenheit. Um, I can't see them. So up here, it's about 25 degrees warmer uh, 60, 80 million years ago. And then there was this gradual cooling over. So the scale here is this is, this is in tens of millions of years. So 80, 60 million or so, down to 10 million, down to 2 million. And now we're down to thousands over here. So it's kind of a funny uh, time scale. But so pay attention, and you'll, you'll see how this works. All right, so, so look at this. Uh, 
the last time, let's, let's, go to, let's go to about 40 million years ago, right here. That's the last time the Earth was ice free, right? So there was grass, there were probably cows in Antarctica, right? I don't know about the cows. Uh, there, were, there was probably grass, right? So there was no ice. There were no ice caps. There's no ice in Antarctica, no ice in Greenland, no North Polar caps, and all of that. The last time the Earth was ice free was 40 million years ago, more or less. And get a hold of this. This is important. This is going to be on the test. There's a test, right, Dave? Yeah, there's a test. Okay. So the temperature difference, it was 8 degrees centigrade, 14 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is today. Okay, let that sink in. What are we talking about in Paris? We're not going to Paris anymore, but the Paris Climate Accords. What are they trying to keep the global temperature? Two degrees. Okay, two degrees. Well, that's, you know, eight degrees is only four times that. I mean, think, think about this a little bit. All right, so, so there's this gradual cooling, and many hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coolings and warmings, coolings and warmings, probably driven by solar uh, radiation changes uh, over these time scales. You can see them here better. See, this is, this is, uh, this is 100,000 years. So there's uh, eight or nine of these. Every 100,000 years, uh, there are these glacial advances, advances when it gets cold and retreat when it gets warm. I want to point you to the, to the, uh, to the Emian, the Emian. So when the Emians walk the earth, when the Emians walk the earth 125,000 years ago, the temperature was three degrees warmer, three degrees centigrade warmer. Okay, but look what sea level was. Sea level was six to nine meters higher, 20 to 30 feet. Let's let that sink in a minute in the context of trying to keep the current temperature increased to less than two degrees. In other words, it doesn't take a lot of temperature to make a lot of sea level but over a long period of time, again, these are 100,000 year cycles. Okay, so now we're down to tens or, or 5,000, these are 5,000 years. So in the last 20,000 years, sea level has risen about 425 feet or so, 125 meters, right, over that 20,000 years with a temperature difference of about six degrees. So in the next picture, uh, we'll have a more of a detail uh, we have more of a detail of that last 20,000 years. Dan is going to show you the same picture so you can get this twice. So there's a couple of things here. First of all, uh, like I said, 125 meters associated with a 6 degree C change in temperature from 20,000 years ago to about 8,000 years ago when this large rate of increase slowed and we had essentially flat sea level, so more or less constant sea level over the past 6,000 years ago. Well, why is that important? When did coastal civilization start as we know it, right? The pharaohs 5,000 years ago or so, right in here, the Mesopotamians, all of the Mediterranean, uh, all of the Mediterranean maritime uh, empires, all during this still stand of sea level. So civilization is tuned to this, this still stand of sea level, including us. Um, oh, just, uh, uh, just for reference, uh, and this is not to say that the next uh, you know, few thousand years are going to be exactly the same as the last few thousand years. Nevertheless, we have 70 meters more equ sea level equivalent locked up in the ice sheets, mostly in Antarctica. So this is why what Woody Allen said is not so irrational. You know, his inordinate fear of sea level is all of a sudden seems much more rational, uh, you know, than that comedy routine would imply. So we've talked uh, before, and I'm sure you've all seen this, the anthropogenic com uh, contribution since the Industrial Revolution began and we started to pump uh, CO2 from burning fossil fuels into the atmosphere. Since uh, 1959, when Dave Keeling started these measurements at Scripps, we were at about 300 and just under 320 parts per million. Uh, as of a few days ago, a week ago, we were at 408 parts per million. 
and the curve is concave upward, it looks like it's accelerating. So to put that into context, in the same last 800,000 years, we've had these eight, these eight big 100,000 year cycles and a bunch of smaller ones, 20,000 or shorter ones, 20,000 and 40,000 year cycles driven by uh, changes in the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Uh, the, the limit here of uh, the upper limit of the last 800,000 years of concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is about 300 parts per million. Well, we passed that about 1920 or so. And you can see this is the so-called hockey stick curve, right, or one version of it. So here we are above 400 right now. The, one of the very large uncertainties is exactly how the climate system, especially the ocean, will respond to this very, very, very large and very rapid increase in greenhouse gases uh, over the last 100 years. This is unprecedented uh, in, in the geological record. I wanted to point something out in the last slide, uh, just to, to, to freak you out a little bit more, if that's possible. So when, so this is the Laurentide ice sheet. We're talking about the ice sheet that covered, you know, it was two miles of ice over New York, uh, you know, 15,000 years ago. And as that ice sheet started to retreat as the climate warmed, there were these so-called meltwater pulses when large pieces of the ice sheet collapsed. Uh, there was, in some of these pulses, and there were several of them, three to six meters per century of sea level rise for four or five centuries. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's mind boggling. You know, 10 to 20 feet of sea level rise every tenth, every, every, uh, every hundred years. Uh, how much, sea, just a quiz question, how much sea level rise have we had over the last hundred years, more or less? Anybody? 20 centimeters, two tenths of a meter over the last hundred years, just to put that into context. All right, so uh, I, I, I've only got about 40 slides to go, so I, I think I'm good, all right? Yeah. All right, uh, so let's talk about sea level. Dan will fill, the, fill in the gaps here, but there's a couple of important points I want to make. Uh, and I, I want to, before I forget, I want to draw your attention to this eight feet. So I want, you to, I want you to keep track of the eight feet, okay, where the eight, where eight feet is, all right? So this is the commonly used uh, Nash, uh, North American vertical datum, it's what surveyors use. Uh, it's close to mean low or low water. So if you look at a tide table, this is a few tenths of a foot different uh, from, from, from that. Uh, so this is mean sea level uh, as measured at the Los Angeles tide gauge just down the road here. That way. Um, and this, these are the annual averages they started measuring in about uh, 1920 or so, 1926 or whatever it was. Uh, and here we go, and you can see the increase, right? The sea level's going up, and it's going up maybe a little bit faster over the last two decades, hard to tell. Uh, these spikes here are the El Ninos, that's 83, 40, 41, here, uh, 57, 59, 82, 83, 97, 98, 2015, 16, uh, those two, 2017, we're back down again to here. And the point of this is the extrapolation. So these are the projections, three projections that are commonly used uh, when we talk about building projects and, and, and accounting for sea level rise, uh, possibly, and what kind of sea level rise we might have to anticipate in the future. Uh, this lowest one is about 1.4 feet by 2100 compared to 2003 feet, or what is it, three feet? Yeah, three feet uh, by 2100 compared to 2000 and 6.6 .6 feet, so 5.5 5 feet. It's almost two meters uh, by, by 2100. So we don't know which curve we're gonna be on. Dan's gonna talk quite a bit about that. I won't talk about that much, what is gonna determine what trajectory we're actually on. Uh, the point I wanna make here is that it's gonna take several decades to figure out which trajectory we're on uh, because of the natural variability, right? The background variability is about a half a foot or so almost bouncing up and down. So for a time, it looks like you're on this trajectory. Right now, it looks like we're maybe on this one. So it's gonna take another 40 years or 20, 20 years or so, maybe through 2040, to be able to differentiate which, which of these tracks we're on. Okay, so this looks like a low number. I want you to keep eight feet in mind, two and a half feet or so, to uh, about three feet, 
mean sea level uh, relative to this NAVD datum in, during the El Nino in 2015. All right, but mean sea level is not what floods us, of course. It's the high waters that floods us. So here's data from the same tide gauge, the LA tide gauge, but instead of the average, I've plotted the maximum monthly water level. So in the 90 years, there's a, I don't know, 100 and whatever, 100 and, 100 and how many, 100 and 90 times 12. There's 90 times 12 uh, dots on here, whatever that number is, uh, 900, I think. Uh, so one dot for each month, which is the observed maximum water level at the LA tide gauge. Okay, now let's look at this. See now eight feet, see now eight, eight feet doesn't, <laughs> see eight feet looked like it was really high compared to the mean sea level. But if you look at the, the, the highest sea levels each month, see in 83, we were already at about 7.6 or so. 2005, we hit 7.7. .7. Well, so that's creeping awful close to that eight feet, right, that I want to draw your attention to here. So these projections, these, these black curves projected out, um, uh, are that mid-scenario, that three foot by 2100, the black scenario in the last slide, uh, except with the added feature of having the return period according to NOAA. So according to NOAA at LA, 246, 7.6 feet NAVD is the 100-year flood return period, the 100-year water level return period, not counting waves. This is just water level. Okay, so, you know, there's something funny right away because uh, this is only 22 years apart and there's two of these 100-year events. That's not necessarily a deal breaker because that's how statistics can work. You know, if you don't have another one of these things for another couple of hundred years, then that's okay. But my point here is, as far as the statistics goes, my point here is that as sea level goes up, you see what happens to what was a 100-year event, water level event, in 1983, namely the 7.6, you see, by uh, 2019, 2019, geez, that's just around the corner. You see, that comes every 10 years on average. By 2047 or so, I'll be 100, by the way. That'll be my, almost my birthday then. Um, this will be a one-year event. So uh, every year, on average, we will have what used to be the 100-year event. And then finally, out here, late in the century, we're basically going to get this 100-year water level once or twice a month when there's a high tide. So, uh, you know, apropos again to, uh, apropos to, uh, to Woody Allen, uh, you know, we, we call this return period creep because of the creeping up as time goes by of these 100 year, 10 year, one year event. And this is how, this is the way that sea level rise will manifest itself in California especially. In other words, through flooding, more and more frequent flooding because of this mechanism. Okay, vocabulary, uh, risk. So a few definitions here. Uh, risk is, you have to have something of value, right? Usually it's, it, it concerns money uh, and a probability of losing it. So either if you have a very high value asset uh, and, a, and a, a low probability, of, of loss, right, then you might have a medium risk or vice versa. If you have a low value asset and a high probability of losing it, that's also a medium risk. So that's the, the usual way I think that uh, people define uh, risk is what's, what can be lost and what's the probability of losing it. So asset, uh, an asset is a value. So it can be infrastructure, uh, it can be uh, development, either both public and private, as I keep trying to stress. It can be a resource, uh, or it could be something as simple as beauty or access, right? So those are, those are assets. And then a threat, well, the threat can be, uh, in our context, uh, come from the ocean, right? Like waves uh, or water level uh, or flooding and inundation. And I make a distinction we can talk about later between flooding and inundation, although in English they're used interchangeably, but they, they shouldn't be because uh, they, they imply to me at least different things. And then of course erosion and damage, which is what we're all worried about, flooding, erosion, and damage. 
Okay, the next comes, the next step in this, in this uh, chain is exposure. And that, the questionnaire is, can the threat reach the asset? Uh, vulnerability means, can the threat damage the asset or destroy it? Uh, impact is, uh, and I'm, I, I, I kind of made this up a little bit. There's different, there's different definitions of impact. The one I like is, does it matter? Does anybody care? And to what, to what degree? Uh, and is it direct or indirect? And then finally, resilience uh, is, you know, can you restore or replace the asset and can you remove the threat? So, you know, I think with that, it, it's, it's valuable. So there's hundreds of these, hundreds of these uh, impact assessments, risk assessments that you can read, uh, you know, perhaps tune to your specific uh, interest. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about Long Beach. So uh, in, the, in the top part of the figure, there's a U.S. Geological Survey uh, quad map, or two of them pieced together there. I took some liberties. I stretched it out horizontally uh, so the, you know, the east, west, north, south aren't the same scale, but you get the idea. So in 1925, there's a couple of things I want to point out. So there's a little bit of L.A. Harbor here. That's this piece right there. Uh, but Long Beach has no harbor infrastructure, so all of this harbor infrastructure uh, is not there. So basically, the Long Beach shoreline is essentially natural, mostly natural. And again, uh, the, uh, the cliff is up there by Ocean Boulevard. And all of this stuff where we are, for example, right here, and of course, all of the port infrastructure, all of this, there's Ocean Boulevard right there. And all of this stuff was filled and built. And so, you know, right now we're sitting where the circle is, right in the middle of San, of, uh, right in the middle of San Pedro Bay, right? We should be having our feet wet but we're on all of this fill. And so this has essentially, uh, you know, because we're, you know, we're seaward of the, of the sea cliff, the elevated part of prop Long Beach proper, uh, th this has basically created the conditions that we, uh, that we face, at least in this part of the Long Beach real estate. That is an interesting story, and I'll talk about the peninsula in a second. There's an interesting piece of the story here with uh, I-710, um, there was a discussion some years back uh, with the port, both ports, about the importance of, of studying sea level and, you know, looking how it fits into their plans, blah, blah, blah. They said, oh, we're not really interested in sea level. We have to rebuild most of our infrastructure because container ships are different, shipping's different, everything changes, everything gets outmoded and rusted, and we'll just build it higher, no problem. And now I haven't checked the benchmarks on this, but... Uh, I understand that, uh, you know, of course, uh, to, to, get the, to, get the, to get the containers out of the port, they have to put them on a truck and drive it up 710. Part of 710 gets flooded. <laughs> so all of a sudden, right, if all the containers start to pile up because sea level rise is, is more and more frequently uh, cutting off the freeway access, all of a sudden, and perhaps even railroads, there's some railroads in here too, aren't they? maybe even the railroad tracks, all of a sudden the port's interested in sea level rise because of the indirect impact that it can have uh, on the port. All right, the peninsula. Now, the peninsula, as I mentioned earlier, down here in Belmont Shores, is a natural feature. You see, that's there. That's already there in the 1925 map, and there's even a few houses on it. So that's nothing, uh, you know, that's nothing new. This is not, this is not a, um, uh, you know, an area that's, uh, that that human sort of on purpose made dangerous and and you know uninhabitable eventually. Uh, that's a natural feature that's been there for quite a while. It's a barrier spit in front of a, what used to be a lagoon, now Alamitos Bay, and it's the ancient uh, you know various drainage uh, paths of the San Gabriel River. Cool, huh? All right. So the peninsula. There's there's a nice aerial shot I found of the peninsula uh, right here. Uh, and I'm going to show you some elevations that I got from uh, Timu Galin that some of you know. She's a professor at UCLA now. Uh, these settings in California are far from unique. They're actually quite common. So this is uh, the Moss Landing Marine Lab in Moss Landing in Monterey Bay. So there's a marine lab sitting right there, threatened, obviously threatened by the ocean. Right? It's kind of ironic. Um, you know, Scripps at least had the sense to build a big seawall out in front of the place. 
So uh, let's see, this is Cardiff State Beach. Uh, state beaches, there's, I work for Parks and Recreation. There's, a, I don't know, hundreds of miles of state beaches. And there's a lot of head scratching going on at headquarters in Sacramento about exactly how to deal with this. This is exactly the same question. How do we preserve these assets for as long as we can? What do we have to eventually do and how are we gonna, how are we gonna face that? Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, Coronado maybe. No, that's Coronado. Uh, I don't know what that is. Mission Beach, I think, in San Diego. This is Del Mar in San Diego. You see the same pattern. This is a river and a lagoon, a lagoon, a lagoon, a lagoon. This is Imperial Beach. Same kind of thing. The houses are built on the elevated uh, uh, dune field of a barrier spit in front of a lagoon. So this is not a, a unique situation by any stretch. It's something that lots of places are going to face. Now, uh, there's, there's the eight feet. There's the eight feet NAVD. See, so eight feet as we go through this seems lower and lower and lower all of a sudden. See, so here's, here's a cross section at, uh, what is it, 64th place? Is that what it says, which is over here somewhere by the, I think it's by the bulge. Timu, Timu called it the pregnant part of the peninsula right here. Um, oh, there's one more thing I want to say, and I think this is also common uh, to, uh, to discussion of many of these places like this, uh, but especially the peninsula, and it's not as obvious here, here as it might be in the next picture. See, it, it's not true. It's not true that the beach here is narrow and the beach here is wide. That's not true. The beach here is wide and the beach here is also wide, but half of it is built on, and so it seems narrow. See, there's, there's beach and dune here. It's just that houses have been built. And this is not an accusatory statement, by the way. I'm not accusing anyone. I want to get to that in a second. Or, or, or in an hour. Yeah. Um, uh, I, it's, I think it's right here. But yeah, somebody yeah somebody from the peninsula can help. But I think it's right there. This is the seaward side. Right. Yes. 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 The seaward side is much much higher than the shoreward side. I think that's what you're asking. And part of that is part of that is natural. So up to about ten or eleven or twelve feet or so. Uh, and this is the power of waves. So waves push sand up. See, waves give us and they take us away. Most waves, other than storm waves, actually push sand up the beach face. And when these waves get bigger and steeper is when they start to tear sand away from the beach face and move it offshore. If there were no waves in the ocean, if the ocean were perfectly flat, gravity would eventually roll all the little sand grains down into deeper water. And you wouldn't have the beaches, at least not the way they look, uh, you know, the way they look uh, uh, in, in actuality with the presence of waves. It's the wave pressure that pushes most of the sand up. So that accounts for the fact why the beach here is higher, you know, about 10 feet or so, because that's the, the, the highest elevation that the run-up reaches for waves that are not eroding. Not er when, once they get bigger, and of course, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't need to be mentioned, but it's, it's very important. Uh, the peninsula, and in fact, all of Long Beach is at least partially sheltered by the breakwater, right? You've got this beautiful, big, beautiful breakwater offshore of, of it's gorgeous. Um, uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, for, 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 the, for, for this context, it's, it's a great thing to have in front of your city. Um, and here, it, it's, also, it's also clear, I think, the cliff line is here, right? And it stops uh, in the Belmont Shore area, this cliff stops somewhere here. And this becomes the eroded part uh, of the ancient, uh, one, of the, one of the former San Gabriel River Valley paths. Um, and you see, the, you see the beach here, uh, you know, continues. It just looks narrow because there's things built on most of the beach. And this is very, very common. The Naval Amphibious Base in San Diego, where all the SEAL teams train, is another very good example of this. So let me show you. So we, we, you know, we, we said that the maximum high tides uh, you know, each month are approaching eight feet. Well, you know, parts of the Alameda's Bay side, so this is the Bay side over here, and that's the seawall, uh, parts of the, many parts of the north side of the, of the peninsula are down here at 
six, five, six. I found a benchmark that's three feet. I might be half a foot below the street level, but nevertheless, some very, very low elevations, and you all know this, that's where flooding occurs. Uh, you really need to talk to Timu about what may or may not be uh, good to do about this. I just want to point out that you know, this, is where, this is where the problem in, in Long Beach from sea level rise is going to manifest first. Anybody still here from the peninsula? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, you know, if you look on the web, if you, look, if you Google um, adaptation, managed retreat, you've heard all of these words, um, you get pictures like this. <laughs> uh, you know, does this, does this look anything like the peninsula? Let me, let me go back a slide. <laughs> So do you see any single houses here on stilts? No. So the, the, whole, the whole concept of so-called managed retreat uh, is, well, you, 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 know, you want to save two things. You want to save your asset and you want to save your, right, two, two things. Uh, but it implies that you have some place to move to, which we don't have, almost, uh, almost nowhere. Uh, on this coast that I can think of, do we have a situation where you know we're threatened by sea level rise? Okay, we put up some defenses. Uh, I think, unless I'm mistaken, uh, all of the houses, or at least most of them, are built slab on sand grade. Right? I mean, none of the houses in California, or very few on the coast, are actually built like they are on the East Coast, where they know about hurricanes, and so they put them on stilts. You got to walk up and down to get you know to get in your car. Uh, but flow can go underneath. You can move the house. There's a picture over here somewhere. Um, uh, so most of these kinds of, of adaptation strategies that consultants throw out, that academics throw out, uh, you know, should be thrown out. That's basically what it amounts to because, because they're tuned to the wrong coast. They don't work on our coast. The, you know, most of these people that, 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 talk about this kind of stuff uh, are talking about it from an East Coast perspective, an East Coast uh, geology, an East Coast setting that for all of the reasons I showed you earlier, uh, you know, just don't apply to our coast, never mind the different development uh, patterns. So here's uh, on the right maybe a little bit more uh, realistic picture. And th this is kind of a long, it's a long thing, it's a long idea. Uh, as sea level goes up, it's known that these barrier islands move so here's the picture of the barrier island. There's the old position. Sea level went up. The barrier island moved. You see this little house over here in red, right? So it's in jeopardy. So eventually it gets, mo it gets lost and it gets moved back here. And they discuss in this paper that this is from the legal background uh, about how this might occur. And I think that part is important. So what are the legalities of this? What are the um, public's responsibilities, for example, for buyouts? What are the private property owners' responsibilities for taking losses, for taking a haircut? And how this, how, what's the discussion that has to happen between now and when we actually face this? As I said, probably first in Long Beach, at least, on the peninsula, how do we, how do we face this? Now, these are down here. I don't want to scare anybody too much on the peninsula. Uh, these are pictures after Hurricane Sandy from New Jersey. Uh, I, I, am, I am almost 100% certain this is not how this is going to unfold on our coast, at least certainly not in Long Beach. What's going to unfold on our coast, uh, this is, I think, Huntington Beach in 19, uh, 1997 or something. I can't remember. It's one of the coastal towns in Orange County. It's going to be repeated flooding that gets worse and worse and more frequent as time goes on for the reasons that we talked about. Uh, and also undermining, this is also from New Jersey, but I think this is also relevant for our discussion because a lot of things are built on sand. Roads are built on sand, as we said. Houses uh, have their slabs on sand. Uh, if erosion occurs and somehow undermines the, uh, which is what happened here, the storm surge removed the sand from under the road and so it buckled in this, in this very artistic way. Um, that would be beautiful if it wasn't, you know, such a dire situation. Uh, I think this is how, I'm pretty sure that this is how the, the, the losses are going to 
manifest themselves uh, on our coast. And there's a list of things to do, do nothing, which is not always the best option, at least not always the uh, least expensive option. Restore the beach, which can be done. Uh, sand is being moved. Uh, uh, restore dunes. Flood proof, meaning uh, make things more waterproof. Uh, elevate, which probably is not an option in most places on our coast. Armor certainly is. And then ultimately, uh, you know, take the Woody, the Woody Allen approach and retreat. But how that happens is really the, the nut uh, of, of this as, as far as what I was trying to get at tonight. So managing losses or, you know, who gets a haircut? Uh, so you want to protect public and private development. So one of the things that strikes me about the, about the discussion uh, by a lot of conservationists, uh, you know, and liberal type thinkers, not that I'm either one, but, but what, what strikes me is that, well, you know, these people built these houses in places that, or the modern, or, the, or even the public development, all of this stuff shouldn't have been built there. Um, so they should take the loss. Well, as far as I know, none of those houses uh, or developments were built illegally. They all have a permit. They all have a permit. They all pay their property taxes. So right away, it seems to me, just you know, as a matter of fairness, if, if only fairness, it seems to me that the public's got a stake in this. Right? It's not like people went out there willy-nilly and built a bunch of stuff and they should suffer the consequences. The public's got an interest in this. Not only that, the public has an interest in restoring natural systems. And if that means removing houses, well, that has some public value, it seems to me. So what might some of these mechanisms be? Well, insurance, flood insurance, obviously. Uh, ownership type change, these are legal uh, definitions of fee simple. Do you, own, do you own your house and then pass it on to your heirs, or do you own your house till you die, and then it becomes uh, you know, some other type of, of ownership? And this, <laughs> you know, this is literally uh, very important estate planning, I'm sure, for some of you uh, here. Um, Public buyout, as I said, the public has some interest here. Uh, you know, they gave a permit, they collected taxes, uh, sometimes substantial taxes on these properties. Uh, so uh, ultimately, and again, this is not probably not until late this century, maybe into next century, is the retreat going to be managed or is it going to be catastrophic? How is this going to go forward? Legal framework, what are the trigger points? When does a, uh, when does a particular dwelling or a particular restroom or a parking lot or some public facility, uh, you know, become un, uh, unrestorable, not, not, no longer resilient. Um, what are those trigger points? Now's the time to start talking about those. And that's, that's basically what I was trying to get at. So, you know, in the end, uh, in, in the end, we're, we're all going to need a bigger boat. Thank you. Thank you.